All right. Good evening. Um, have a seat. I'll wait a second. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for coming out on this cold evening. Uh, I am uh, thrilled to be here. This is uh, an amazing opportunity and uh, uh, obviously a, a great audience. Happy to be in from the cold. Um, I wish I could, whoa, maybe this has to be off. Well, that's the light. How's that? Is that better? You lost me. All right. How's that? Good. Great. Okay. Uh, I wish you could be here for the Alien Pagels talk. That's actually going to be much better than this one. So um, maybe you made the wrong choice if you can only make one. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk to you about Google, and I'm going to talk to you about Google in terms of its uh, powerful and uh, stunning effect on culture and information. And I'm going to talk about Google in contrast to some more familiar vehicles of culture and information, the book and the library. Uh, Google, of course, uh, doesn't, as a, as a company, as an institution, doesn't pretend that it's replacing libraries or replacing books. But the discourse around digitization often takes that tone. And there are evangelists who have declared that the rise of Google and the in, incredible proliferation of uh, digital information uh, might replace books by making them seem obsolete, making them seem a little bit slow, uh, making them seem a little bit dusty, uh, less usable. Uh, I want to avoid that bind. I want to avoid that sort of either or uh, approach to either books or libraries, and instead talk about how Google is working its way into our information ecosystem in many ways already has dominated our information ecosystem, has set many of the terms of exchange for information and culture. Uh, this is going to have pretty profound repercussions on education, on globalization, on uh, the ways that we relate to each other. Uh, and, and much of this has yet to be fully accounted for, which is why I'm hoping to get ahead of the curve. And, and, and try to make sense of this. So my book in progress, The Googleization of Everything, is not a biography of a company. It's actually an account of our relationship with the phenomenon of Google, the variety of services and presences, presences, if that's a proper word, uh, that, it, that Google has in our lives. Uh, so allow me to sort of outline where I'm going, but, but keeping in mind this contrast between uh, Google and what a library does for us. Now, Google is part. Whoa, there we go. Okay, <laughs> Google is part of a, a a long tradition of a dream of universal information. It's often been expressed as a dream of a universal library, although um, in recent years it's sort of taken a, a different tone because it's about universal connectivity and the availability and of access to information. Uh, and so we, you know, we often invoke the Library of Alexandria as the uh, as the sort of uh, the, the great lost opportunity. Um, the amazing thing about the Library of Alexandria is that it takes on a cartoon form in our heads when we think about it. It never actually was that great a library. It certainly didn't serve the people of the world. Uh, it was a stunning collection for its time, but it actually lasted a pretty long time, like sort of longer than we think, right? It lasted a number of centuries in a variety of forms. It, it, it burned several times. It had a number of other accidents, and there were invasions. And, uh, and the, so the story of the Libra Library of Alexandria is a lot more uh, complex and frustrating uh, than we often think of it. Like the, the cartoon version is, of course, it was great. It had everything, and then... You know, we forgot how important that stuff was, and we burned it to the ground. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Uh, in the Enlightenment, in the Enlightenment age, we once again sort of had this, uh, we articulated this notion uh, that we could collect and collate and connect all of these worlds of information uh, and, uh, and have a tremendous effect on uh, how human beings related to each other. Uh, and there's, of course, a tremendous amount of hubris attached to that vision, right? The, the, the encyclopedias of the 18th century were hubristic. They were, they were uh, based on the idea that you actually could compile, compile tremendous amounts of information, make it universally accessible, make it digestible, 
uh, and lead people toward a, a more enlightened state. Uh, the ensuing centuries have shown all of the different complications with that effort as well. In the early part of this republic, of course, uh, founders such as Jefferson and Madison were deeply invested in the notion that uh, providing access to uh, an enlightened uh, electorate was the only great hope for, uh, for letting a republic such as this one grow and thrive. Uh, we've seen dystopian visions like Borges, the Library of Babel, uh, which of course isn't actually universal. It's sort of universal in the sense that all of the Roman letters can operate um, uh, in, a, in a complicated way in that story, but of course most of the world doesn't use Roman let letters. So, uh, uh, Vannevar Bush's uh, article, As We May Think, from 1945, set up this notion that documents themselves might talk to each other. Documents might actually be enmeshed in a pretty powerful way, uh, a way that we now look back on and say, oh, well, look, look what web pages do. They actually do what, what Bush said documents might do. Uh, Kevin Kelly, in uh, May 2006, published a, an article you may have seen in the New York Times Magazine called Scan This Book, in which he revived and, and, uh, and, and, and described the, the new version of Universal Library, or the, the power of a Universal Library. Kelly was excited by the notion that Google was rapidly scanning the collection of a number of university libraries, uh, and had announced that plan in late 2004. Uh, Kelly uh, was convinced remains convinced that this scanning project can finally get beyond the tyranny of the book cover and the tyranny of the index system uh, and can actually empower us uh, to mix and mash snippets of text to write new forms of knowledge for ourselves. Uh, and so he was celebrating this democratization of information, uh, but he did so in a very... Uh, technocratic way, right? Uh, he did so in a way that sort of made it seem that we would have no say in this process, that in fact the technology would just make it happen and we would have to go along with it and adapt to it. Dave Weinberger uh, uh, wrote last year a very provocative book called Everything is Miscellaneous in which he, he steadily undermined the notion of, of, of uh, the sort of traditional habits of library cataloging uh, and said that now that we have the power, we the people have the power to tag every document, to tag every piece of knowledge and create our own label system and make these labels relate to each other and link to each other, we don't need subject headings. We don't need any of the traditional skill sets of librarians. And we don't need libraries because after all, once we digitize everything, uh, all of these documents will sort of sit out there for us and we can easily access them through these boxes on our desks. So what we have then is, <laughs> what we have is, is a, a really interesting set of uh, movements in the world of information. We have a set of ad hoc movements. We have libraries around the world, both university libraries and national libraries, engaged in digitization projects, engaged in, in sincere efforts to link their collections with larger and larger audiences. And they're doing so without any sets of standards, without any agreement on, uh, uh, on indexing methods. Um, they're, they're simply scanning stuff as fast as possible, and not that fast, basically. And, and, and supplementing that, perhaps replacing that, is Google's effort, Google's effort to scan some of the major libraries in this world. At this point, Google's library scanning project uh, encompasses something like 30 libraries, 30 university libraries around, uh, around the country and, and with many examples uh, around the world as well. Uh, it's difficult to keep track of the total number, largely because some involve university systems, which have multiple libraries, but somewhere around 30. It's a tremendous collection. We're talking about many millions of books added to Google's already uh, impressive collection of, of web documents and PDFs and databases. Uh, all of which have been indexed by Google Spider. So you have this sort of layer of standardization largely imposed by Google, but not exclusively by Google. And you have all beneath that all of these ad hoc efforts to organize and disseminate information. So this book is an attempt to make sense of this process, right, of both the ad hoc and the 
Google-driven efforts. Uh, and, and so let me explain for a second the title itself. What do I mean by Googleization? Uh, well, OK, actually, what do I mean by everything? That's the more important question. What am I talking about exactly? I'm not actually talking about everything. My dog won't be Googleized, as far as I know. But, uh, but I am talking about three major areas of uh, human concern. One is communication. Google is active at, in, in disrupting and rewriting the rules in some very positive and exciting ways. The world of communication. Let me give you one example. Uh, Google's in the process of uh, uh, establishing agreements with mobile phone companies around the world to let mobile phone companies or to enable mobile phone companies to uh, sell phones with the Google operating system on them rather than a, uh, a homegrown operating system or the Microsoft operating system or the BlackBerry operating system. What does this mean? This is significant because the Microsoft operating system or the BlackBerry operating system or the iPhone operating system are basically black boxes. They're pretty much uh, uh, subject to the whims of the company that developed these operating systems. Google explicitly uh, wants a very different uh, process. They want to create an operating system that anybody can create an op uh, a, a program for can customize, for instance. This also means that Google wants to sell us phones that we can use on any system, kind of like it works in Europe. So you can just slip out the SIM card and move it onto another network if your network ends up treating you very badly. Wouldn't that be great? Because after all, who really loves his or her uh, mobile phone company, right? Uh, and, so, and so this process of, of, of making that area of the communication industries behave according to Google's terms is, falls under this notion of the Googleization of communication. Google is also being, uh, uh, is also very active in making sure that the internet stays a lot like what we're used to. Uh, the internet has been basically a dumb network, one in which all of the intelligence is on the endpoints, you and me, right? All of the decision making about about what goes on on the internet, what sort of communication goes on on the internet, is subject to the user's desire or, or the box that's sitting in front of us. But the network itself doesn't actually make editorial decisions. Uh, in recent months, we've seen a number of internet companies try to pretty radically alter that deal. Comcast, which I'm sure many of you love as well as you love your mobile phone company, Comcast is now at, has now had to admit that it's been filtering content, slowing down content from certain sources as a way, it says, of sort of shaping their bandwidth and making sure everything works more efficiently. But it raises all sorts of suspicion. Basically, Comcast is now a phone company. And if Comcast wanted to make sure that uh, companies like Skype, services like Skype or Vonage didn't work as well on uh, the home high-speed internet uh, networks, uh, it could certainly do that and drive more customers to its own digital phone service. Uh, this notion of, uh, of network neutrality that Google is fighting to preserve is essential to making sure that the internet actually remains democratic, remains open, remains uh, uh, interesting, um, remains crazy and loud and filthy, but interesting, right? Uh, and, and at least it remains the the fertile environment that we're used to. We're used to, uh, for at least you know, 20 years now, seeing some pretty tremendous uh, creative enterprises done, executed within this fertile environment. Google actually being one of the best examples, a tremendously creative company, one of the best companies in the world to work for, one of the companies that really uh, uh, manages to attract the brightest possible talent, not just by paying a lot of money but by, and by having free massages, but by giving people uh, uh, some, some really exciting projects on which to work. Uh, and so the Googleization of communication is, is, is an essential part of what's going on here. Um, the world of communication will never be the same because of Google's presence. The Googleization of knowledge is a different story. How do we decide what's important? How do we decide which resources are better than other resources? How do we decide which facts and ideas should uh, have uh, dominance over others? Well, we like to think that we have that sort of process already figured out in a messy way through consensus and debate and, uh, and authority and all those sorts of markers that we've been using for centuries now. Not an ideal system, but you know, so far so good. Google instead has taken the algorithmic approach 
Uh, it's decided that what's important in the world is determined by um, incoming web links on web pages, which is a proxy for consensus in a way uh, among a very small set of human beings. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, it's a very different model of quality of knowledge. And so this process of, of, of using Google, the, the habit of using Google as a first step for information seeking has a pretty remarkable, in fact, radical effect on what we consider important in the world. And the Googleization of us. Google knows a lot more about you than you know about it. It knows a lot more about me than I'll ever know about it, and I'm trying to write a book about it. Uh, Google has a dossier on all of us. Uh, it, it has a pretty good idea what you're interested in. And if you think for a minute, that's not very comforting. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it has a justification for keeping a dossier on us. Pretty good justification. Google's officers argue that it has to know a lot about our habits, our histories, our predilections, our preferences, our fetishes, whatever it is, because it wants to serve us better when we plug terms into the search box. If we have already demonstrated that we are interested in a certain kind of shoe, then Google's imperfect search technology, of course, can better deliver that kind of shoe or whatever preference we have based on this history. That's how the argument goes, right? So for instance, it's, so every Google search is basically customized. One of the, one of the most obvious ways of customization is, is, um, um, is uh, geographic. Uh, so uh, over the summer, uh, starting about this time last year, I started considering moving from New York City to Charlottesville, Virginia. So I started doing a whole lot of web searches about Charlottesville. I had to find out all kinds of stuff about schools, about utilities, about cost of living, uh, you know, where the libraries were, all that good stuff. So I did a lot of Google searches with the word Charlottesville in there. I did a lot of Google searches with zip codes from Charlottesville in there. Um, I was doing a lot of searches on real estate sites and so forth. Well, Google tracked my habits. And before I knew it, even though I had not yet decided to move to Charlottesville, in generic web searches about almost anything, I was getting very high results that were Charlottesville specific. In other words, it had shaped my search results to satisfy what it thought I was obsessed with. And I kind of was, but that doesn't mean every search about everything should yield uh, Charlottesville results. So you could say, well, as a consumer, that really helps me. And it does, if that's all you are. But if you're a citizen or an information seeker or a scholar or a student, maybe that's not exactly uh, how you want your search results to run. Google also maintains a dossier on you to be able to target ads to you. So that it's not just the search results you get that are customized to your interests, but those ads that run along the right side of every search result page that are customized to you. Now, there are different levels of dossier keeping. If you happen to use Gmail and you sign into the Google universe, then Google has a lot better information about you. It, uh, it keeps information a lot longer. For instance, it scan, has its machine scan all your Gmail email uh, for keywords. So it finds out what you're writing about to your friends or enemies or lovers or ex-lovers and, and then uses that to help focus the ads. In fact, embeds ads in the, in the mail itself. Uh, so if you're a Gmail user or use any of the other Google services beyond web search, if you, for instance, use iGoogle, the customized entry page, or, or you use Google Documents as a word processor or a spreadsheet, then Google, every time you sign in, Google has you in the Google universe and keeps a very detailed dossier on you. Uh, and you've essentially agreed to that, even if you weren't really clear on how that works. And it's that transaction that fascinates me. What are we actually giving to Google in exchange for these ostensibly expensive services that we are getting for free. We don't ever write a check to Google. I bet no one here has ever written a check to Google. Maybe Google has written you a check if you happen to host a blog with Google AdWords on it. right? Maybe you've received money from Google. But generally, we don't pay Google for all that we use, which is a pretty stunning thing as well. Uh, you could say you get a lot more out of Google than you do NBC or CBS, even though NBC and CBS are basically built on the same model. Right? For both NBC and CBS and for Google, we are not the customers. We are, in fact, the product. The information is not the, customer, not, the, not the product. 
the show you watch is not the product. The people watching are the product, right? The audience is the product. The service is the, is the ad, right? The customer is the ad company. And that's essentially what's going on here with Google. So our relationship with Google has to start with that level of awareness, that in fact, we are being Googleized as much as the information is being Googleized. We are not sentient beings to be involved in some sort of republic of the internet when dealing with Google. We are, in fact, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, raw material. What do I mean by Googleization? Googleization is the process of being rendered, being processed, being accounted for by Google, having your life changed by Google, right? So the mobile phone business has been Googleized in a different way than you or I have been Googleized, but nonetheless, the, the process of Googleization is, is, is pretty all-consuming. Now here's the mission statement of Google. <clears throat> if you go to uh, uh, the About Google pages, uh, it's actually a pretty quick link from the web search. You'll find a whole lot of pages describing Google policies, the history of Google, Google's founders, etc. And this stands out. This is Google's official motto, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Now this isn't too different from the perhaps unstated, unarticulated vision of every librarian in the world as well. Right? If librarians actually had their wishes come true, they would have access to all of the world's information. They would be able to grant us access to all of the world's information. They would organize it in a way that would actually serve our needs very well. That's essentially what librarians are set out to do. So Google and librarians have similar goals. Google has a lot more money uh, and has figured out some really neat tricks to at least simulate this effort. Sergey Brin, who is the one of the co-founders of Google, was once asked in an interview, what would this perfect search engine be? And he said, it would be like the mind of God. This, by the way, is a Google image search of the mind of God. And uh, it's pretty revealing. Um, uh, the mind of God apparently sort of hovers around the margins of the world's religions. Uh, you see a whole lot, you probably can't read this very well, but uh, uh, you know, you basically find a lot of, um, I don't want to necessarily use a derogatory word like cult, but you find some marginal religions, and, and uh, I've clicked through a few of these. You get very few images from any of the main, major, mainstream uh, religious denominations of the world. Um, and there's a reason for that. Google, because it relies on incoming links as a proxy for quality or relevance, uh, Google rewards the motivated, right? And uh, those active in marginal groups are often more highly motivated than those active in mainstream groups. It's one of the sort of paradoxes of, uh, of, uh, of, of the net, uh, of, of the internet um, culture, is that, is that if you're really into something, you can find yourself rewarded uh, in ways that in the real world, in the babble of the real world, it's almost impossible, right? The, the, the folks at the margins of whatever field you think about, the margins of scholarship, the margins of politics, the margins of religion, the margins of ethics and morals, those folks find it really hard to get people to pay attention to them in the real world, in the analog world, uh, because you have to stand on a soapbox in Hyde Park and shout, and it doesn't always carry that well. But in the Google universe, having that sort of marginal presence is actually quite rewarding uh, because you can organize your own group to create pages and links that get rewarded. So what you have, though, with that statement from Bryn is a pretty bold claim, right? That, that, that a perfect search engine, which of course Bryn would like to make, would actually serve a universal purpose. A universal purpose. And you know, look, for the past century, we have grown suspicious of claims to universalism for some very good reasons. We haven't given them up, right? We still would like world peace. We still would like understanding. We still would like a universal acceptance of our fellow humanity. But still, a claim to universalism is quaint, right? It's, it's rare that we have those sorts of statements. But here, 
uh, a co-founder, one of the major officers of one of the most important companies in the world, is basically claiming uh, a will to universalism. And what we're stuck with then is Google being omnipresent, right? It's in so many lives. It's not in everybody's life because not everybody is actually attached to the internet. It's omnipotent in one sense because it is the richest internet company in the world right now. It is the wealthiest search engine company. It is one of the wealthiest companies in the world, although it's a lot poorer now than it was three weeks ago. But that's true of a lot of American companies. It's omniscient, it seems, right? At least it has a will to omniscience. It would love to know everything about us. It would love to know all of our movements. And we keep volunteering to let it track us in all these different ways. There's another thing that Google has claimed to be beyond these three things, benevolent. Uh, this is Google's unofficial motto. It comes out of uh, uh, some early uh, uh, think sessions with some engineers when they were trying to figure out what the character of the company, the goal of the company should be. And one of the reasons that a lot of early brilliant uh, programmers went to Google is that they had a desire to work for a company that was not going to be evil. Um, the assumption here is, of course, that Microsoft is evil. Uh, I'm not convinced that Microsoft is evil. I'm not convinced that Google is evil. I'm not convinced that Google is unevil. Uh, and yet, it seems like a really hard thing for Google to shake. It, in other words, it's still part of its lore. It's still part of its presence in the world, its reputation. It's one of the reasons that a lot of early adopters of uh, of the Google search engine. There was, a, there was a moment not so long ago, eight years ago or so. By the way, Google's only about 10 years old. Um, and already it's had a pretty tremendous effect on our lives. But about eight years ago when uh, Yahoo and Excite were, uh, were among the top search engines, uh, Google really had a strong presence among the sort of technologically elite. Uh, and, and this motto was part of it, right? People used to say, no, you shouldn't use Yahoo. You should use Google because Google is benevolent. They maybe didn't say benevolent, but you know, look, Google doesn't annoy us with screaming banner ads, was, goes the argument. Google has this clean interface, a clean interface that seems to respect the user. Uh, Google is not making software that will um, take over your computer. Uh, Google is actually invested in keeping the internet free and open rather than closed and proprietary. All of those arguments are pretty much true, and it went into this early myth that Google was the good company, the good company for which to work, the good search engine to use, uh, and it's really helped Google grow. Google's major growth, it, it achieved the level of being the most popular search engine in this country without buying an ad for itself, which is pretty stunning. You never saw a Google Super Bowl ad. You never saw a Google ad during anything, right? During Seinfeld, during The Simpsons, they never had to buy ads. They actually grew, grew. Google grew because people said, hey, you know what? Check out Google. You'll really like it. Now, that's, there's actually a huge debate right now uh, about why Google achieved and maintains dominance in search. There's no, there's no clear empirical way to demonstrate that Google is a better search engine than Yahoo or a better search engine than MSN. In fact, most of the social science studies that have been done on search engine quality can't find measurable differences. When people sit down and run their searches on these engines, on these searches, they get different results. But there's, there's no consistency that shows that people generally prefer Google results to Yahoo or MSN. And Yahoo and MSN have a presence in our lives and maintain a presence in our lives for reasons beyond quality. I mean, they, they, they work just about as well as Google. There really isn't a measurable difference. Uh, but MSN, the Microsoft search platform, um, is used largely by people who have plugged their computer in, fired up Internet Explorer, and used the default search service on Internet Explorer. Uh, they're, they're, they're perhaps the less technologically savvy or, uh, or less critical consumers of the Internet. Uh, and certainly that's true in, uh, in parts of the world where uh, cons computer penetration has not yet reached saturation. So Africa and parts of Asia, where people are still buying computers for the first time, uh, they're, they're tending to open the box and plug right into the Microsoft network. So that's where Microsoft's uh, search growth is from. Yahoo 
maintains a large portion at this point, about 35% of the US search market, largely because so many people for so long have had Yahoo email and Yahoo start pages. Uh, and it just sort of makes sense to stay with it. There's no good reason to leave that. Um, uh, and yet, as, as more web users have sort of tried to invoke more sophisticated uh, searches into their lives, some people have gravitated to Google. A lot of people have gravitated to Google. Here's a search for me. Uh, I'm sure you've done a search for you. Um, this is, uh, is interesting, not just because it's about me, although I do find that interesting. Uh, what's interesting is that, uh, is that this changes almost every week. The results change almost every week. Um, this particular search I did, which was uh, about a month and a half ago, um, the top, you can, if you take out the book results, uh, Google, by the way, knows that I buy a lot of books, so it tends to put book search results in almost any relevant search that I do. It's not true of everybody. If you tend not to buy books, it doesn't, it's not instantly signaled to put books up top. But if you, if you take the book results out, um, which I'm thrilled about, by the way, uh, uh, but if you take the book's results out, the top hit is the Smashing Pumpkins fan site. Smashing Pumpkins were a once relevant band from Chicago <laughs> that hasn't actually done anything in a long time. And I actually think I'm more relevant than the Smashing Pumpkins, but, but Smashing Pumpkins in this case retains uh, the top web hit uh, in, in this Google search. Um, the, the, the YouTube video actually falls under the Smashing Pumpkins result. It's sort of a subset of that. The next one is the Wikipedia entry for the Hindu god. Uh, this is gratifying. I'm really glad that this ends up being uh, next, although I think it should be more important than the Smashing Pumpkins site, because after all, like a billion Hindus, you would think that that would matter for something. Um, but for a long time, uh, any reference to the Hindu god would show up in like eight or nine when I would do this search for a long time. And, and still occasionally it ends up three or four. And, and the variables are really hard to predict. Kind of depends on where I'm sitting, if I'm using my own computer or someone else's, what part of the country I'm in, uh, what part of the world I'm in. All of these things are variables in what the search. So in other words, these search results change almost weekly and, and largely depending on where I go and what computers I use. Um, my own blog ends up there, which is nice. Uh, my Wikipedia entry ends up there under, for some reason, as a subset of the Hindu god, which is kind of cool, but, but I don't know, maybe raises expectations a bit too much. Um, but really, you know, for a while, I was actually, my blog was coming up top for this search, which was really scary. Uh, and, and, and also exemplified one of the things that's basically weird about the Google universe, right? That, that because I have a web presence, or Smashing Pumpkins has a web presence, of motivated people, the Smashing Pumpkins or my blog get privileged over most references to the Hindu god. By the way, the Wikipedia entry now has been consistently high, sometimes first. Uh, but that's actually a function of the fact that all Wikipedia entries have been rising in Google searches for the last 12 months. Sometime about 12 months ago, Wikipedia entries started hitting the top 10 results of almost every search of generic terms. Uh, and I'm really not sure why that happened all of a sudden. Google won't talk about why certain things uh, end up high in certain searches. Uh, but uh, I suspect that at some point, uh, the engineers at Google wanted to have something to counteract this notion of motivation. That might, that's one theory. Uh, the other theory is that actually, because the Wikipedia community is so motivated to link within, right? Every, every Wikipedia entry has links to other Wikipedia entries. And many people who use Wikipedia use it as the sort of reference for links on their own web pages. That that has sort of almost, you want to, I don't want to use the word naturally, but sort of uh, 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 automatically driven up Wikipedia entries. Um, here's a search for Holocaust that I did about a month ago. Uh, and one of the nice things here is that these are actually very reasonable, dependable results for Holocaust. This hasn't always been the case. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, actually even later, five years ago, if you would search the term Holocaust, you would find Holocaust denial sites in the first page of results. Largely, again, because of the motivated communities. People who deny the Holocaust have a lot of time on their hands and, uh, and tend to link to each other, right? They tend to salute each other with links. Um, and they spend a lot of time trying to prove each other right by uh, linking to each other, whereas the rest of us who actually don't doubt the Holocaust don't really 
feel the need to link to reputable sites because, after all, everything's reputable about the main site. So, uh, plus the very notion that sites are what matter. In the early days of the internet, you would launch a site because you had something to declare, and something as obvious as the Holocaust occurred didn't seem that uh, that urgent. Uh, now, so but. Google has intervened in this. This was actually often used as a criticism for how search engines work. Uh, people, for a number of years, cited the fact that uh, Holocaust denial sites were privileged in Google and other search engines. And so the, the Google engineers have um, tweaked their algorithms to make sure that denial sites don't show up on the first page. They do actually start showing up in pages three and four as you click through. If you search the truth about the Holocaust, it's all Holocaust denial sites. But who would type in the truth about the Holocaust? You know, I mean, unless you're already predisposed to find a Holocaust denial site, you're not going to say, I'm going to find out the truth about the Holocaust. So, um, well, I guess I did, but I meant to show it to you. Um, but you can still see a tremendous number of, of Holocaust denial sites out of that. Here's a search for copyright. Uh, I wrote a couple books about copyright, so I, 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 I wanted to use this as, a, as a, an example. This is specifically a search within Google Book Search. The Google Book Search works differently. Google Web Search is, of course, based on this sort of vote system. Every incoming link to a page is a vote by the internet community. But it's a weighted vote. So if, you, if, if a particular page gets links from some very highly respected pages or very popular pages, like Talking Points Memo or Boing Boing or some of the bigger blogs or, or a link from the CNN.com page or the Washington Post page. Those links count more than a link from my blog, for instance. Uh, but th that's, that's a system that sort of makes sense for that environment, right? The, the fast moving environment of the web. Uh, for books, you have a very different system because books tend not to have hot links within and among them. Uh, and so, uh, uh, what, I was, what I'm suggesting here is that if you get a chance to play around with Google Book Search, which is the index of all of these books that Google's scanning in from libraries, plus a number of books that Google has uh, achieved authorized access to with deals through publishers, uh, and you, you pick a subject you know a lot about, right? Something where if someone were to ask you, what are the five most important books on a subject? What would they be? And you had a pretty good answer, five, you know, maybe five books about Rwanda, five books about, uh, uh, about the, the, the British monarchy, right? Five books about World War I, something you know a lot about. Five books about the Philadelphia Phillies. I don't know if there actually are five books. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I know, I couldn't help myself. So um, <laughs> they all have a very sad ending. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm not making friends here. Uh, you know, and, and run that on Google Book Search and, and see if any of those books that you know are authoritative uh, show up anywhere in the first couple pages of, of, of the search. And I have found almost never, almost never do these uh, sort of authoritative books, the same books that you would get from a librarian if you asked. If you walked into a law library and you said, what are the five books I should be reading if I want to find out about copyright law? Um, well, I'll tell you what, this one by Richard Rogers Bowker called Copyright, Its History and Its Laws, being a summary of the principles, blah, 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 is a great book. Uh, and it was, in fact, the best book ever published about copyright in 1912. Uh, and I used it for my dissertation. Uh, it was very helpful. Um, I would suggest anyone who's writing a history of American copyright consult it. But for anybody just curious about copyright, I would say there are probably better books. Um, uh, and uh, what you'll also find beneath that is uh, a whole lot of public documents, in fact, public domain documents uh, that come up in this search. Interestingly, the public domain documents are inaccessible in full form, even though you own them, because Google's, Google's computers automatically put it in what it calls snippet form if it was published after 1923 uh, to, to uh, allay the concerns of copyright holders, even though you are the owner of this document. You can't read it in Google Book Search. So there are all sorts of problems with Google Book Search uh, based on the fact that it's not the web search, right? It doesn't have the same principles. It doesn't work the same way as the web search. All right, one of the problems with our use of Google, and one of the things I would like to deflate as we explore Google, as we understand it better, is this notion that Google is somehow a new, neutral arbiter of information. Right? Google is a very convex lens. It is not a flat window pane. 
it does choose winners. It's not always clear how or why it chooses winners. And we should question that all the time. It doesn't mean we should stop using Google because the principle on which Google does web search is basically the same principle that MSN uses and Yahoo uses. And frankly, we can't live without it. I can't live without it. I don't go a day without using Google. I actually, since I decided to write this book, I've totally bought in. Like I'm, I do everything that Google offers. I, I click on everything. I, I sign up for everything. I'm sort of living in a Google world right now. Um, I've been completely Googled and Googleized. Uh, and uh, I, I met a gentleman uh, where I gave a talk last week down in North Carolina who, uh, who has decided that he's going to try to live a month without using any Google services. Um, and he's actually writing me regular updates about it. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like, I mean, I suggested maybe he wants to go to Green Gulch or some Zen Center, you know, to, 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 to try to do that. Because living in the, in the real world is really tough these days without Google. Um, but we do often lazily assume that what Google's offering us is a, a snapshot of what is important or true or relevant or useful. Uh, and 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 behavior studies, uh, web search behavior studies have shown a couple of important things. First of all, people rarely click on any search result after the first page. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost always click on one of the first three web search results. Secondly, people don't distinguish well between the paid ad results on the right side of the page and the larger, broader column of unpaid results that come up in web searches. Those are two important factors. It means that most of the people who use Google and other web searches are not really careful. They're not interrogating what they do. Um, that's not necessarily bad. We can't expect people to constantly say, but wait, maybe on page five, there's something better. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's important that we not imagine that Google is merely a neutral tool. Remember, when Google counts incoming links, it does weight them based on what it considers to be other important pages, pages that have already won the web election. That's inherently conservative, not in a political sense, but in a sense that it is very hard to, to, to push winners off of pedestals, right? To, to push winners down from the top of a set of search results. It's very hard to, to completely realign search results. So while the Smashing Pumpkins or my blog or the Hindu God might trade places on the first page, they're always on the first page, always. Um, and that's troublesome. There may be a much more important Siva somewhere in the world that you might never know about because he or she doesn't have the same motivated uh, audience that the Smashing Pumpkins do. Um, now, it's important to remember that while web search, the major Google service, is not neutral, is somewhat troublesome, is subject to all sorts of cheap shots and unfair criticism, and certainly maybe that's what I've offered. Uh, it's about the best we can imagine, right? No one's come up with a better idea. Let's be frank about that. No one's come up with a better search engine than Google, at least in a demonstrable sense. I don't believe that Google is the best, but that's because I pretty much think that the major three and most other search engines are the same. I mean, they work pretty much the same with different customizations depending on how much information they have about you. But it's appropriate for the web. The web grows every day, but the web also shrinks every day, right? Pages appear, pages disappear. It's a really troublesome archive. How do you make sense of a collection like that? You can only make sense of a collection by copying everything you can, and that's exactly what search engines do. They make copies of every page they find, and they keep copies in their index in their big server farm somewhere in the Pacific Northwest with air, massive air conditioners working all the time. Right? Google's not really a green industry. Um, uh, and, uh, and, but it, but it kind of makes sense. right? It, it, I really can't imagine a better way to make sense of the web. And the web is really cool and a great thing in our lives. right? But it's not necessarily appropriate for other areas of knowledge. It's not necessarily the right way to search scholarly databases. It's not necessarily the right way to search books. Right? The, the, the issues of metadata, the issues of subject headings, the issues of authoritativeness, the issues of brand names and publishers, all of these things matter when we choose 
one book over another, one piece of information over another. Now, much of what we think of as the grand body of knowledge of the web is actually based on uh, or rewarded by these sorts of highly motivated groups. Um, the crowdsource, the wisdom of the crowd, right? Because of it, it seems like a grand democratic election. And by the way, just to avoid any questions at the end, this is not me. Uh, <laughs> In the court, despite the resemblance, and I am actually a Buffalo Bills fan, but that's not me. Um, I just thought it was a nice picture of a crazy crowd. Um, so, you know, Dave Weinberger wants us to think that the model for the web, which is almost necessary, right? The fact that if you're going to make sense of photos, of a huge collection of photos, like you find on a system like Flickr, um, you need Flickr members to tag them, to say this is of Mickey Mouse, or this is of Mount Everest. Uh, or this is of a flower. And to be able to use those sorts of tags to cross-index and find collections of flower pictures, right? that makes sense. It's a lot better than employing people to go through and index them according to standard subject headings. Uh, not that that couldn't also be rewarding. So again, because the web is fast moving, uh, ephemeral, uh, and, and, and is growing and shrinking at the same time, that sort of tagging system works better than a standard library index system. But Weinberger says, because the web is good, let's use that model for all areas of knowledge and information. I think that that's a big mistake. For one thing, it doesn't actually take into account the value of professionalization. Uh, professionalization uh, often gets a bad name because there's, you know, it's undemocratic. It's somewhat elite. There certainly are biases built into the system of professionalization because certain classes of people get to be professionalized and others do not. Uh, nonetheless, the web world is actually not as open and democratic as we like to pretend either. Certain classes of people in certain parts of the world at certain income groups, uh, certain income levels get to be netizens, get to be uh, authoritative influences on how we experience the web, people including Dave Weinberger and myself. Um, but it's not always the best system. Professionalization has many virtues, uh, and, uh, and the wisdom of centuries uh, should actually matter. So is this the best we can do? What about the wisdom of expertise? What about creating systems that actually capture synergies between a library, which is a Republican system of information dissemination, one built on virtue, selectivity, authority, with a sense of openness and democratic purpose, and this mad, messy democratic system of the web. Is there a way to achieve a Madisonian, uh, Madisonian uh, uh, compromise between these two situations? If we are going to do that, what should it include? What should this universal library really include? I'm not convinced that Google is the vehicle to a universal library, actually. I'm pretty convinced it's not. I'm also unconvinced that libraries, as we currently envision them, can be expected to achieve that sense of universality. But let's also pause for a second and wonder whether a notion of universal connectivity to information is all that great an idea. It might not be that great an idea. For one thing, you might end up with all sorts of ethnocentric results, right? You might end up with privileging some languages over others, some cultural groups over others, some religions over others. You might not actually serve the species at large as well as we might hope. But let's suspend those issues for a second and say, we can figure that stuff out. But let's hope that we can, perhaps plan, to try to gather up everything we can and then make sense of it. When should we start doing that? Well, actually, I think we should be deliberate about this. We should be slow about this. We should not hope to have a universal library in 10 years, or even our lifetimes. There's no reason to do it fast and badly, when slow and well would actually serve us much better along the way. There's certainly no reason to do this in a highly opaque manner, which is essentially what Google's doing. We're letting Google, out of frustration or awe or timidity, letting Google perform this service for us, rather than actually engaging uh, all of the resources and concerns and powers of debate that we have throughout the world. We have to emphasize also that 
The Google Book Search project may be the sort of a point of criticism for how Google is going about their project, but it's not the only one. There might be a better way, or at least a better system of, uh, of exchange that can handle web pages or audio or video or periodicals. I'm sorry, I translated this from Mac to PC and periodicals broke over the line. The S is just sitting down there. Uh, data sets, of course, data sets for research, especially for science. Uh, that's something that uh, is sort of too important to be privatized by Google. Uh, much of what we produce, the knowledge of the future, should be done under an open access principle, one that does not restrict access to uh, the wealthy, the connected, the elite, those affiliated with universities. Um, we have to start adopting open access models for all sorts of knowledge production. Uh, not just scholarly journals. This is a very small but important part of any effort toward a universal library. We have to remember that private actors are going to be a very important part of any grand scheme to, uh, to connect information to people around the globe. Uh, and we can't ignore their interests, but we also cannot let their interests be paramount in the construction of a global universal library. We have to make sure that we establish standards that we, when I say we, I mean basically people active in knowledge production and organization, university faculty, university students, librarians, citizens around the world, people who have an investment in the dissemination of information. Um, but we should not be afraid of regulating. The web is not a regulation-free zone. It is not a libertarian zone, despite many of the fantasies of techno-libertarians. The web is highly governed. It's highly governed by private interests, but it's also highly governed by states, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, the terms uh, through which Comcast delivers you a service are highly regulated, although poorly regulated, by the FCC. Uh, and in fact, the state of Pennsylvania has a lot to do with how Comcast and other telecoms operate as well. Uh, you may remember the effort a number of years ago to establish uh, uh, universal Wi-Fi access in, in Philadelphia and the ways that uh, your fine governor undermined that because his friends at Verizon weren't so happy about that. Um, uh, there are all sorts of ways that um, there are all sorts of ways that the state interacts with these information systems. And we often have this myth that the internet is a state and regulation free zone. The real question is, are we going to have regulations and state influence that actually maximize universal access to knowledge, or are we going to merely work for the interest of a handful of powerful inter private interests? Now, let me give you a, a little story about a different way to do things, a different way to build a library. <clears throat> In the 1980s, there were a number of very important labs around the world uh, involved in the sequencing and annotation of the human genome. Uh, here in the United States, the National Institutes of Health was uh, in charge of coordinating these efforts. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the finest uh, molecular biologists in this country were involved in that project. There were competing efforts, not coordinated efforts, but competing efforts in France, in Japan, in the United Kingdom. Most of the folks involved in the Human Genome Project in the 80s and early 90s were pretty convinced that it would take 30, 40 years to complete the sequencing and annotation of the human genome. Uh, they were very concerned about the potential privatization of this knowledge, the notion that certain private companies could use the patent system to, uh, to corral uh, some of this important knowledge and, and make sure that it was owned by and controlled by only those select companies. Uh, a guy named Craig Venter, really smart guy, uh, was working with the Human Genome Project for a while. And he came up with a method of sequencing that was a lot faster than what most of the labs had been using around the world. Uh, and so he broke off and started this, his own company called Solera and said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do it faster and better. And I'm going to license this information. He was very bold and open about the fact that this information that he was generating would then be something he would own, control, and license to, for instance, pharmaceutical companies, although he did say he would gladly license it at a lower rate to universities. Well, the reaction was interesting. In the face of the massive privatization of all of this information that is not only of us but in us, the scientists of the world rose up in protest and petitioned their states 
to help fund and coordinate an effort to compete with Solera. Not wipe it out, not make it illegal, not regulate it out of existence, but in fact to race Solera. And that's exactly what happened. So within a very short period of time, the United States and France, Japan, and the United Kingdom coordinated their efforts uh, and managed to essentially tie Solera in the publication of this database. Uh, in fact, uh, the journal Science and Nature published the versions of these two databases on the exact same day in a coordinated uh, uh, moment, a moment coordinated by President Clinton and Prime Minister Blair uh, at the very end of President Clinton's time in office. Uh, and this, I think, serves as a model for what could be done if we consider perhaps a human knowledge project, a way to garner, collat collate, collect, and connect all of these disparate pieces of information and not let one company govern the entire process, but in fact use all of the motivations and resources around the world to perhaps come up with a better system. There are experiments that are beyond Google, some very exciting experiments. The Open Content Alliance is uh, in the process of digitizing public domain works through the help of a variety of universities. Uh, and the Open Library Project is working in conjunction with the Open Content Alliance on this. Uh, Wikimedia, the uh, sort of company that is uh, loosely in charge of Wikipedia, although actually the Wikipedia community is in charge, uh, is also engaged in uh, creating a search engine uh, that would compete with Google and the other private search engines, an open source search engine that might uh, be able to uh, embody these, uh, these values better than the private, uh, the private system. Some of the goals of this effort, multilingualism. Perhaps we can't represent every language group in the world and every culture group in the world, but we should not be satisfied with a, 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 an archive dominated by English. Um, it should be completely networked and linked. It should be accessible. It should be beyond text, although text is actually the best place to start because it's the easiest stuff to index. It should, it should rep represent rough consensus within communities of knowledge. And it should respect user privacy and confidentiality. It shouldn't just be a way of harvesting private information. Uh, which can have some pretty dangerous results. The idea of the library, though, should be one of creating conversation. It shouldn't just be one of point-to-point -point dissemination of information. By the way, uh, if you use Google Image Search to look for the word cosmopolitan, this is what you find. Um, so I thought that was kind of cute. Again, highly motivated groups. Um, let's also remember that just because something's digital doesn't mean it's better. And, and the place through which you access information is as important as the interface. right? So the, the temples of knowledge dissemination are not out of date. right? They aren't too expensive. In fact, it would be too expensive to forget them. Um, this point is motivated by a, a really sad conversation I had a couple months ago. I was giving a talk at one of the premier liberal arts colleges in this country. Uh, premier means like 40 grand a year, right? So, uh, but no, it actually is a, a really tremendous liberal arts college, one that produces more CEOs than you could ever imagine and has a, uh, an endowment way beyond uh, belief for its uh, small faculty and number of students. So you know, they can pretty much do whatever they want. Well, it's time to build a new library there. And the faculty committee gathered to help design the library has come up with some pretty stunning and exciting plans for this new library. And what they found is their board of trustees keeps saying, why do we need a library when we have the internet? Why do we need a library when everything's electronic? Why do we need a building to do this? Right? So I think it's important that we keep emphasizing that, that this technology is actually the best possible gateway to a customized search for information for a subtle search for information, an appropriate search for information, you don't have to put filter technology on this interface. You can actually just trust that person's judgment because that person is highly trained and experienced. And leaving the human out of this process is one of the greatest mistakes we can make. Unfortunately, we seem to be making it at an alarming rate. So there is a better way to imagine a universal library. 
a universal digital library, one that can actually supply essential information to the underserved, right? This should not be about making it easier for my students to write papers. I actually want to make it harder for my students to write papers. It's part of the learning process, right? It, it's, it's not about making it easier for me to write papers. It's not about serving my perceived needs as a consumer of information. It's not about making sure that the, the privileged high school students of the United States get a better road to information. It's actually about making sure that 12-year-olds in South Africa can discover useful information that might, might make a difference in their lives, where for the, for, the, for the past few centuries, they have been denied access to the great torrents of information that have blessed so many of us in this part of the world. So if we keep in mind that it is actually about pushing this information to the parts of the world and the people who have been underserved, we can actually end up serving us all better. That should be the goal first, instead of uh, building a really flashy, elaborate, and, uh, and somewhat frightening dystopian universe uh, that seems to be the direction in which we're going. So I would only ask us to do this whole process, if we're going to do it, if we actually think it's important, and I do, to, uh, to create a universal digital library, uh, that we keep in mind that we are not necessarily the first beneficiaries of it, although we might have to step up and, uh, and take control of our own political and information systems to get it done. Thanks very much.